Thanks very much. Um, I'm not sure how much people know and how, how many people have already probably followed the news and know more than me, but I will attempt to give what is our understanding as Iranian leftists anyway of what is happening now in Iran. Um, some, of, some of it is in the article published in last issue of Weekly Worker and on the Hopi website, but um, some of it is obviously new. Uh, but also I will hopefully be able to tell you a bit more about um, other aspects of struggles that isn't covered by the news, including the protests in the universities and the student protests and the very start of labor struggles in Iraq, the start of labor protests. Um, they say a week is a long time in politics, but I suppose the last week in Iranian politics has been the longest ever, even for those of us who went through 1979 and remember how events can change very quickly, very suddenly, with no uh, pre-planned programs by anybody really. Um, what is exciting about what is happening in Iran today, I, in my opinion at least, is that it is ordinary people who are dictating what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Many of the papers are calling this a debate about the election result. I personally disagree with this, and I will, the reason I disagree with this is that a very large percentage of this 85% who allegedly voted, we don't know exactly how many people voted, but there is a, an allegation that, or a claim by the Iranian government that 85% of the population voted. A very large percentage of that population actually um, didn't, uh, didn't participate in order to choose between these four candidates. And I have very good reasons to say that. Up until um, the early part of June, up until the 3rd of June, there was total apathy about these elections in Iran. Total apathy in that the Iranian papers were saying themselves, why isn't there any news? Why has no, is no one covering this? What happens that changed this were the accusations of the two factions against each other on televised debates. And primarily the debate, the, the ones that really, uh, if you like, uh, started the fires in Tehran in terms of debate, argument, and so on, was the one between Ahmadinejad and Mousavi. Not that either of them had anything dramatic to say, in my opinion. What was dramatic was that Ahmadinejad, having done a poll from his own team, his campaign team, and realizing that he is, uh, he is likely to lose, or at least it might be a close vote, decided to go for the attack against the reformists, against all of the reformists. I don't think there is any Iranian above the age of 18 or 19 who doesn't realize that Raf Sanjani is the biggest crook in the country. It's not exactly the biggest secret in Iran. Most people know that. Most people know you don't become uh, one of the richest men in the world, never mind in Iran, by selling pistachio nuts. You must be involved in something a bit more serious. So the actual allegations that Ahmadinejad made in that uh, debate, and it was a desperate um, measure, in my opinion, uh, wasn't air shattering. Um, however, it was crossing one of what the Iranian government keeps telling its own people, you can fight amongst yourselves. And you heard this yesterday from Khamenei, the supreme leader. You can argue, you can say many things, but there are some red lines you don't cross. And one of those red lines was to publicly acknowledge that Rafsan Johnny is a crook. Uh, is a corrupt man. Not only Rafsanjani, but Ayatollah Nasir Nuri. He's quite an important man. He's one of the elders of the Islamic Republic after Rafsanjani. He's quite serious, quite an important figure. It was, and in fact, Musabi's performance, at least from what I could gather from internet presentations, was quite a mild, lukewarm presentation. He, the only thing he could say was that some of your uh, foreign policy um, statements have worked against us, which I think most people would again, it, wouldn't, it wasn't exactly new to Iranian people. Um, 
I, I had in a job made a number of fantastic other uh, claims in that um, interview. He said that he, his government had taken Islam to Venezuela, that he had received a letter of apology from Tony Blair when the Navy personnel were uh, released, and that's why they released them. Mousavi went on the aggression on the foreign policy. He said, your slogans are strong, but your attitude is really soft, like you gave away uh, the best presents that we had, which were these hostages, the Navy personnel. And Ahmadinejad, I think, had to quickly respond. And his immediate response to this was, but I got a letter of apology from Blair, which was then denied by the Foreign Office, and all sorts of things like that. So, uh, uh, the claims by Ahmadinejad didn't do well for him. And I think he probably lost even more supporters, in my opinion. But Mousavi didn't gain much. What happened after that was that because the president had crossed the red line, people in the street started debating all sorts of issues. Corruption, deceit, the fact that uh, there is a very big gap between the rich and the poor, the fact that students in universities are really fed up of this interference in their daily lives. They're really tired of going to university every day with the military present on the campus and so on. So the debate moved on. And it moved on beyond the realms of the Islamic Republic. Those like me who were still calling for a boycott in the last week of the presidential election were repeatedly told that we are responsible, individually we are responsible for the disaster that is Ahmadinejad. Had it not been for our boycott in 2005, Iran would have had a reformist president, okay, things would be still terrible. Nobody had any illusions that things would be fantastic. But at least we wouldn't be the, you know, the pariah of the world and all sorts of other things like that. Um, I still maintain that I think those of us who kept that position of boycott were right because the four candidates were very limited. They were chosen by the uh, Islamic Council of um, uh, uh, Guardian Council. Uh, a lot of even soft opponents of the regime were uh, were not allowed to stand. These four are the pillars of the Islamic Republic. I mean, none of them are exactly uh, uh, opponents of the regime.